Hello, I'm Aaron Lohr, and this is the Endocrine News Podcast. We know that illicit use of anabolic androgenic steroids is dangerous, but cessation comes with its own challenges. Today we're talking about a study presented at ENDO 2023 titled Self-Administration of Post-Cycle Therapy is Associated with Increased Probability of Subsequent Normalization of Reproductive Hormones Following Anabolic Androgenic Steroid Cessation in Men. Joining me to talk about it is one of the study authors, Dr. Chana Jayasena. Dr. Jayasena is a specialist in the field of reproductive endocrinology and leads a research team at Imperial College London. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Jayasena. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so my first question is, how widespread of a problem is illicit use of anabolic androgenic steroids? It's an increasing problem, and we are worried that it will continue to increase further. So taking a historical perspective, 1950s, it was rarely used by elite athletes. Fast forward to the 80s and 90s, bodybuilders, amateurs are using it, so it's still very, very uncommon. Now, we think, uh, in terms of latest estimates, a couple of studies from America, but also the UK have come out. We think between 1% and 5% of all men in the population are or have recently taken that. That's an enormous number of people. Mm. And that puts it comparable to things like cocaine use and cannabis use. Wow, that's a little surprising. What does that sort of steroid use or misuse do to the body? How harmful can it be? It's important to say that there are several medical uses which are therapeutic for, for example, hypogonadism. But when men take that outside of this indication, they take it because it makes their muscles bigger and it makes them, they think, look great and perform better physically. But I like to sort of think about the side effects as three distinct groups. So there are the effects on sort of neuropsychiatry. So it can make otherwise chilled out regular guys have tantrums, be irritable, even provoke psychosis and violence. So it will make someone like literally if someone honks on the, on, on the horn in the street and get out and actually start punching someone and get arrested. Then there are the effects on the heart and the cardiovascular system. So it causes cardiomyopathy, it can cause dyslipidemia and echo changes. And this greatly increases the chance of sudden death. And then finally, there are the endocrine sequelae, which because the steroids will suppress LH and FSH from the pituitary, will cause absolute infertility and erectile dysfunction. And it's quite common for men to know this and to get things like Viagra and other erectile dysfunction drugs at the same time, just because they know what it does to their body. So given all the potential harms Mm -hmm. and and side effects, it seems like cessation would be a, a great idea. But what happens to the body when someone tries to stop using steroids in this way when they have been using it that way for some time? We know that you get a state called hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So the thing is, the testes will not immediately wake up from suppression from exogenous steroids. And recent work published by David Handelsman and also from, from the Netherlands shows that it can take months and maybe even years for that wake up to happen. But in the meantime, these men have no erections, they have no libido, which is surprising and unique from other forms of hypogonadism, complain of suicidality a lot. That's very mm. common. And that may be because of where they start from and the type of guys they are. But it's awful. And that in itself will trigger them to restart and by definition is a form of dependence. Is there currently a, a treatment or something to help cessation symptoms or folks who are going through that cessation process? Yeah, so I asked one of my my research team to kind of do a scoping on current strategies. It didn't take them very long because there's nothing out there Mm. and there's no guidance at all. And so no one knows what to do. We're all very uncomfortable with it. And yet we're all encountering these guys all around clinic. I certainly am. When I speak to colleagues in the US and, and the UK, they are too. So there are no accepted strategies at all. And I think in the absence of that, everyone is trying their best to deal with these men who are in agony and can be quite intrusive and irritated and desperate. So they're not the easiest patients to treat. Mm. But I think the absence of anything else, most of us are kind of saying, well, just stop. The problem with just stopping 
is we've been telling that to people, you know, to stop, just stop eating, just stop taking heroin, just stop right. drinking alcohol. And there comes a point when desperate people can't do that. So the big question I'm interested in is, can we do better? One thing that your study looks at is post-cycle therapy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So post-cycle therapy is something that these guys have concocted through online forums by reading about what infertility drugs do. So they kind of done DIY endocrinology. Oh my. And that is dangerous. And I want to stress to everyone that it's very important that none of us condone this because I think medical legally, but also from an evidence point of view, nothing I'm about to say must be viewed as condoning it. But it's really interesting to understand the effects. Right. Okay, so they are giving themselves drugs to stimulate and reduce feedback on the pituitary and hypothalamus. So things like selective estrogen receptor modulators, clomiphene, aromatase inhibitors, so to block estrogen signaling, such as an astrozole, and then directly stimulating the testes, things like human coronic gonadotropin. And they are giving themselves between two and 12 weeks of this stuff immediately when they stop taking steroids to try and soften the fall. So that they go from, and one of them says, from being Superman to Clark Kent. And they're using these drugs in an attempt to try to make that transition last a few weeks. So you can kind of see why they're doing it, mm -hmm. but who knows what they're doing? And these men, they, they're not endocrinologists. They're not gonna give themselves controlled doses. So that's the concern. They could be doing something that puts them in more harm than any good. It sounds like it's a good thing to look into and see what's actually going on with post-cycle therapy. And that's sort of what sounds like what you're doing. So what did you and your team want to find out about post-cycle therapy in your research? Yeah, so we, we were very intrigued at this practice that we saw these men were doing. And we wanted to try to objectively, as much as possible, analyze what the effects were. And we teamed up with an addiction unit in Glasgow. And Glasgow is it has an enormous deprivation index. And in the UK, unlike the US and some other countries, there is no fear of prosecution if you are personally consuming drugs. So there, you will be prosecuted if you try and sell, but there is a very good interface to the healthcare system because these men themselves will not get arrested for taking these drugs. That's another story if, you, if we want to debate whether mm. that's right or not. But we have good access to these men. And what they've done over the last seven years is actually see guys who have stopped, who've made that brave leap and have come to the clinic for a checkup. And these clinics, they actually did a blood sample to check on their reproductive hormone status, to check on their state of recovery, to help to inform the guys what to do. Now, the crazy thing is they didn't do this. They're not endocrinologists. They did this off their own back. And they've been doing that for seven years until they met us. And they've done a really, really good job. And these men had or had not voluntarily taken PCT. And we were privileged, we were delighted to actually collaborate with them. I sent a student up to there. We were a bit worried. We had to sign lots of paperwork and waivers. But basically, they gave us permission to raid and audit all of their notes, their case mm. notes. And it gave us an unparalleled look into the appearance of the world of these men and what's going on when they give up. Well, let's dig into it then. So what did you do in your study? Tell us a little bit about, you know, how you went about finding what you found. So as I said, I really like to be open-minded. We, we, we didn't know what we were going to find, but what we did is we collected every bit of data we could. And these men, we recorded characteristics like their age, what they'd taken. Sometimes they didn't know what they'd taken and whether they took PCT or not, what type of PCT they took and various other characteristics in the blood test results. We didn't have symptoms, however, and that's something that, that I think is really important to consider. And then what we did was we put all the results into a multivariable regression model. And all that means is that we know that lots of things influence probably recovery from steroids, and that might include your age, that might include how long it is since you've stopped, Mm -hmm. That might include how many drugs you're on. You know, so the more you're on, probably the more profound your suppression. And then we pulled out independent variables using this robust analysis. And it was really neat. It was really rewarding to find that, first of all, as others have reported, sensible things came out of, of this study. So the longer you waited, 
the more likely you are to recover, which we know. The more drugs you took, the more likely you are to recover. We know, so that's reassuring. It tells us we're in the right ballpark. And fascinatingly, it showed that in men who had stopped steroids within three months, taking PCT increased the chance, the probability of normal reproductive hormones by fourfold. And that was really interesting. And I think the size of the study, over 600 men, allowed us to have the power to analyze this, whereas others had failed to find this in the past. One thing I think it's really important for us as endocrinologists to understand about the data is one of the limitations. So remember, this work was not done by endocrinologists. It was done by the Drug Addiction Service. They didn't know that you need to, as a gold standard, measure reproductive hormones in the morning when fasted. And therefore, these are random results, which means that we would have underestimated testosterone in some of these men. Now, I think knowing that helps us to interpret things because some men who had recovered and were normal would have falsely not have been picked up. But everyone who we thought had recovered is highly likely to have been recovered. So we had an extremely rigorous endpoint. And that's why we're going to have to repeat this with fasting morning samples. But knowing that detail is, I think, very important. I think one of the most fascinating parts about your story is that this is the first time endocrinology has taken a look at post-cycle therapy. And I imagine there's still a little bit of ways to go and there's more to learn. So can you tell us what are the next steps? You know, what do we still need to learn? Yeah. So as I alluded to, I think it's very easy to reduce these men to a serum testosterone, which is low, and LH, which is low, and FSH, which is not recovering. But these men are going through anguish. So what we mm. want to do now is actually study the same process prospectively, but look at the symptoms using rigorous, validated scores that we do when we do testosterone trials. So that's what we want to do. We, we, we want to apply rigorous endocrine methodology to these guys to actually study the withdrawal syndrome and characterize it. It hasn't been done in a way that, that endocrinologists understand or there have been qualitative studies kind of just talking about Yes, they feel awful and these things happen, but actually, what is the velocity? What is the probability of recovery? We can give these men hard data to hopefully help them to recover. And of course, on the horizon is another challenge, which is to try to see, can we cannibalize what they've been doing, this PCT, and actually improve on it? Mm -hmm. Is PCT something that could help in some form to soften the blow not to use perpetually, which would be wrong because that's just the same as medicating them for an addiction, but to give them time to access drug and alcohol support services and therapy, social help to look at why they've taken it and help them stop for good. So again, it's a fascinating story and I would love to have you back on as you get those future learnings so we can see how this is evolving. No, thank you. I'd love to do that. So we're out of time, but Dr. Jayasena, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your work with us. Thank you. And that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm always on the lookout for exciting news stories and topics to share with you. If there's something you'd like to hear us address, let me know by emailing me at podcast at endocrine.org. I appreciate your input. Until next time, thanks for listening. Endocrine News Podcasts are a free service of the Endocrine Society. To learn more or to become a member, visit the Society's website at www.endocrine.org.